Jim students, faculty, and staff who are attending the webinar today. I thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you and for your taking the time to learn about university and career planning in a post-COVID-19 world. My name is Dan Adkins. I am the CEO of Transnational Academic Group, and we are the organization that operates Curtin University here in Dubai. By way of introduction, I wanted to let you know why I'm here talking to you. Prior to joining the university, I spent 20 years in the IT industry, the majority of that time as a hiring manager and a, a senior officer working with companies like IBM, Dell, Clorox, Hershey's, and Visa, companies that you would be well aware of. And in that time, I got a lot of experience with what employers want and what jobs are going to be strong in the future and going forward. I've now been working 13 years with universities, including Curtin University, and as part of my job, I work very closely with our careers program and again have very strong contact with employers, not only throughout the UAE, but around the world and a good understanding of what those employers are wanting. Now, at the start of the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and in doing so, uh, while I am not a medical doctor, I have spent a significant amount of time researching and reading the literature from the best epidemiologists in the world to understand what is going on with COVID-19 and what is likely to happen going forward. So I'll share a bit of that with you because it helps everything else that we talk about make sense. So let's start with talking about COVID-19. It's a worldwide pandemic. It's affecting nearly every country on earth, most of them severely. Now, I realize that COVID-19 is the name of the illness and that the novel coronavirus has a different scientific name. However, for the sake of simplicity during this presentation, I'm just going to refer to both of them as COVID-19. Throughout history, generations have been defined by major events. In my grandparents' generation, it was before World War II and after World War II. In your grandparents' generation, the world was divided into before humans walked on the moon and after. And the space race inspired people to choose careers in science and technology and resulted in the internet, computers, smartphones, and other technology that we use today. So it was really the turning point of an entire generation. In your parents' generation, the world would have been divided into before the September 11 attacks and after because they forever changed the way that we fly and many other things and created a huge demand for jobs in intelligence and law enforcement. In your generation, it will be the time before COVID-19 and the time after, because nothing like this has happened since 1918 and the flu pandemic then. So let's look at some of the impacts quickly and then we'll start talking about the careers and what you'll need to do to get into university. So of course, one of the things that I'm sure you've all been experiencing and in the hands of gyms, you're in very good shape on this is online learning. Uh, schools and universities around the world have had to move to online teaching in order to slow the spread of the virus and flatten the curve so that health systems don't get overwhelmed by the number of people with the virus and result in a significantly higher death rate. Most educational institutions were not prepared for this. And in the initial weeks, it was rough for many 
and many went with very simple approaches such as recording the teacher's voice over the PowerPoint slides and making that available for download. At Curtin Dubai, uh, partially because my background included risk management and disaster recovery, we were prepared uh, and we were running fully interactive online classes with small groups of students as a pilot more than two weeks before the government ordered that we go to all online. So by the first day of the mandatory online classes, every single Curtin Dubai lecturer had been trained, all of the technology was set up, and from the very first day, our students were attending class online exactly as they had been face-to-face, -face, being able to chat with the lecturer, ask questions, answer questions, have small group discussions, all of that. Now, as the result of the lockdowns around the world, essentially all end of secondary exams have been canceled, including all of the UK board exams and the IB exams, all of the Indian and Pakistani board exams. And it's really made it very challenging for graduating students as they don't have and they can't get the results that are normally required for university admission. To add to that, in nearly every country, including the UAE, large gatherings have been banned, which means this year there was no GTEx and there have been no face-to-face -face university fairs, making it very difficult for students and parents to meet with university representatives and get their questions answered. The pandemic has also led to travel restrictions. And at this point, nearly every country has some level of travel restrictions, which has kept students from visiting universities that they were interested in and is almost certainly going to prevent international students from traveling to overseas universities in the fall. A week ago, I attended a panel discussion of the top UK educators that was held by the Times Higher Education Organization. And every single person on the panel said that the fall 2020 teaching period would likely be too soon for international students to come to the UK to study. In fact, just today, Cambridge University was the first to announce that all classes for the 2020-2021 academic year were going to be online. And if Cambridge, which is usually in the top three universities in the entire world, has decided to do that, it stands to reason that the vast majority of UK, American, Canadian, and Australian universities are also going to be online for most, if not all, of the next academic year. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, how long will this pandemic last? And it all comes down to a concept you've probably heard people talking about in the news, but you probably don't actually understand. So let's get to that. And the concept is called herd immunity. When this pandemic started, no one was immune to it because the virus was new. So it spread very rapidly. And the rate at which a virus spreads is called the R naught. That's the way scientists refer to it. And for COVID-19, the R naught is two to three times as fast as the flu or the common cold. Now, when someone has a virus, they generally become immune to that same virus for most or all of their lives. However, this does not seem to be the case for coronaviruses. Of the seven known coronaviruses that can infect humans, four of them only give one to two years of immunity. Two of them, SARS and MERS, were so deadly that they died out before the level of immunity could be determined. And the last, COVID-19, has already seen people who had the virus test positive again later. We don't know whether that's a testing error or if the human body is not able to create a sustained immune response, especially if the first infection was mild. A vaccine, thankfully, should give a lasting immune response. So when either enough people have had the virus and therefore become immune or have had the vaccine 
and have therefore become immune, the virus can no longer spread and it dies out because there aren't enough people who can catch it to build a transmission network. This is why you hear people on the news talking about contact tracing, where you find if this person had a virus, who have they been in contact with so that you can quarantine those people. Right now, according to the world's best epidemiologists, these are people who study the spread of pandemics, given the spread rate of the virus, Without a vaccine, we will be looking at a situation like the 1918 flu pandemic, which lasted about two years, possibly longer, if the natural immunity isn't lasting and people continue to be infected. If one of the eight vaccines that's currently in clinical trials is successful, it will still take about another two years to get enough people vaccinated that the virus can't spread. So you'll notice that two years is the best case in either scenario, and some very credible experts are putting the end of the pandemic three years out. During that time, we are likely to have rounds of lockdown, followed by periods of freer movement, going back and forth to control the rate of infection and to prevent the medical system from getting overwhelmed. A paper out of Cambridge University released today said based on what has been seen across the world, it appears we'll need to have 50 days of lockdown, followed by 30 days of freer movement, followed by another 50 days of lockdown, continuing off and on all the way through for about two years. We can look at Germany as a good indicator. They locked down for two months and within a week of allowing some free movement, the infection rate started to climb rapidly and they're having to lock down again. Similar things are already being seen in China and South Korea. So what are we looking at? Well, McKinsey and Company is one of the world's most respected consulting firms, and they've laid out nine scenarios for how the economy might recover. The best estimates by economic experts who are actually taking into account the projections of the pandemic experts is that the world is going to go through an economic downturn as bad or worse than the 2008 global financial crisis, and that it will likely take at least 10 years after the end of the pandemic for the economy to get back to the size it was before the pandemic, something similar to what is shown in the chart that I'm showing you in scenarios B1 through B5. But in reality, the world will never be the same. Some things are going to change and never go back. Last week, the US announced that the unemployment in the country is at the worst it has been since the Great Depression of 1929, with over 20 million jobs lost just in April and 15% of the US workforce out of work. Similar numbers are coming out of many countries and both business and personal bankruptcies are at the highest seen in the world since the Great Depression. The world will be very different when this is over, and some of the things that are likely to be seen based on history are these. From what was seen after 1929, people were scared that they wouldn't be ready if there was another crisis, and they started saving money in order to have a buffer it's very likely that coming out of this pandemic, we're going to see people saving money to have a buffer, which means they won't be buying as much as they did before the pandemic. Also based on 1929, people simplified their lives. They decided to move into smaller houses and apartments with fewer things so that they could save money. They realized that what's important are the people in their lives, not the things, so they cut back. People didn't go on as many trips or as grand of trips, and even businesses cut down on business trips, especially in today's day and age, where businesses have very quickly realized that everything they need to do, they can do over electronic means like we're doing right now, and that there's not really any need for a business trip. So there is going to be far less travel 
than there used to be. And this is going to have a significant impact on the travel and tourism industry in many ways from bankruptcies to fewer jobs. Because people would not be buying as much, businesses won't need to produce as much, which also means fewer jobs. Businesses will also be saving money to provide a buffer against the next crisis, which means that they're going to try and operate with as few people as possible, which also means fewer jobs. They'll be looking to outsource to countries with cheaper labor. They'll be looking to automate and in other ways, eliminate as many jobs as possible to save money. So because there are going to be fewer jobs, the competition is going to be intense and it will be important as a student or someone entering the job market that you're able to set yourself apart from the competition. So I'll talk a little bit later about some of the ways you can set yourself apart, but first we need to look at what jobs will and won't exist and what jobs will be in demand in the post COVID-19 world. And since most of you are planning on heading for university or probably all of you, I'm going to focus just on careers that require higher education and a university degree. So even if you've already chosen your career, you may need to revisit that choice. You need to consider if the career you chose was in an industry that's going to get much smaller and therefore have a huge oversupply of experienced qualified people, such as travel and tourism. You need to consider if it's a job that is going to end up either automated or outsourced to a country with low labor cost so businesses can save money, like most manufacturing jobs. But it's not all bad news. There are industries that are going to grow, especially the sciences, engineering, computing, and healthcare. There are also industries that are always going to be needed, like marketing, finance, education, management, and law. And of course, the trades will always be needed, electricians, carpenters, plumbers, and mechanics, because those jobs can't be done by robots and they can't be sent to other countries. And of course, very importantly, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are people who find needs in the world and develop businesses to fill those needs. And these entrepreneurs are going to be the heroes of the future because they're going to create jobs that build the new economy. So based on these things, what are the careers that will be best in a post COVID-19 world? Well, let's start with today's heroes, medical professionals. The people and governments of the world will never want to be caught in this position again where they aren't ready for a pandemic. So there will be significant demand for medical professionals. Unfortunately, in many cases, it's going to be to fill the jobs of those who lost their lives fighting COVID-19 or gave up because of the risk and stress in the field. But there will be a huge demand there, and it's one of the most noble professions anyone can go into. In addition to doctors and nurses and other frontline medical professionals, dentists will continue to be in demand. We as a world have a sweet tooth and we need dentists to take care of our teeth. Across the world, the average age of the population is getting higher, especially if you're looking at the more developed countries, the US, Europe, Japan, and the need for elder care is growing far faster than there are people to fill these roles. So even if you decided, I don't really want to be a doctor or a nurse or another frontline medical professional, there's going to be a huge demand for people who understand geriatrics and elder care. Epidemiology is going to be hugely important to make sure that the world is ready to deal with the next pandemic. And there will be one. There will be a next pandemic because humans continue to eat animals, which puts humans in contact with wild animals that are a reservoir for diseases like COVID-19 and Ebola, 
and it puts humans in contact with meat from domestic livestock that are given so many antibiotics that they develop antibiotic resistant pathogens that then infect humans. If you look just in the past 15 years, there have been two major Ebola outbreaks and there have been three outbreaks of coronaviruses that crossed over from animals to humans. So it's going to be hugely important to have epidemiologists who can help the world prepare for the next pandemic. It's also going to be very important to have people who can develop the vaccines that will protect us both from diseases we know now, like malaria, HIV, and many types of cancer, and from COVID-19, of course, as well as protect us from the diseases that will come in the future. If you want an idea of what this could be like, Jonas Salk developed the vaccine for polio, which had killed or paralyzed millions of people just in the 20th century. And Edward Jenner developed the vaccine to prevent smallpox, which had killed nearly half a billion people between 1900 and 1970. So if you went into virology and developed a vaccine, you could end up being someone who will be talked about in a very positive way for hundreds of years. We in the UAE have been very, very fortunate when it comes to food security during this pandemic because of the wise decisions of our leaders. But not all of the world has been so fortunate, and most of the world has now realized that you have to grow enough food in your own country to feed your population, or they may starve during the next pandemic. We are facing numerous threats from monocultures being destroyed by fungus, like bananas, and plants not being able to deal with the effects of climate change. You may not know this, but the kind of banana you're eating now is a clone. Every one of those bananas shares the exact same DNA because they're cloned one from the other. And this type of banana has only been around for about 90 years. Before that, there was another type of banana that everyone ate, but it also was a clone and they were completely wiped out from the face of the earth by a fungus. The bananas we eat now are currently being wiped out again by a fungus, and we're gonna to have to come up with another kind of banana. So you could get into crop bioengineering and be the one to fix these problems. If you think about it, right now, there are just under 8 billion people in the world, and the best estimates are that by 2050, there will be 10 billion people. So in order to feed everybody, we're going to need another green revolution like the one started by Norman Borlaug, whose crop engineering is estimated to have saved the lives of more than 1 billion people who would have otherwise died of starvation. And by the way, Norman Borlaug received the Nobel Peace Prize for saving a billion lives. You could be the next person to do that. Other areas that are going to be important are the medical fields and the STEM fields. Biology will be hugely important in developing new treatment for diseases using things like CRISPR-Cas9 and even bringing animals back from extinction like rhinos or woolly mammoths. Chemistry is going to be hugely important in developing new chemical compounds for making faster, less expensive, and less environmentally hazardous batteries and electronic devices. I think every single one of us would love to have a smartphone battery that lasts a month or a battery for our laptop that lasts for a week instead of running out in a few hours like they do now. Physics is going to be hugely important in developing an understanding of important things like how do we deflect an asteroid so it doesn't hit the Earth? If you look back to the early 1900s and the Tunguska asteroid that hit in Russia, if that asteroid had hit over a city 
it could have killed tens of millions. And of course, 65 million years, an asteroid hit Earth and wiped out all of the dinosaurs. We'd rather not be wiped out like the dinosaurs. So we need physicists. We also need them to look at dealing with climate change or something that's really important, like how do we make your Wi-Fi faster? Engineering is also going to be hugely important in the post-COVID-19 world in so, so many ways. For example, given that there are going to be an additional 2 billion people on Earth by 2050, if engineers started building a city of 1 million people every single week for the next 30 years, we would have only built the housing necessary for three quarters of the people who are going to be born by 2050. There is a tremendous demand. It's also important in other ways. We need new sources of energy to combat climate change and pollution, and of course, to provide power for two billion more people. I think all of you want to make sure that the internet and your laptops and smartphones keep working. So we need people who can work on solar energy. And you may not know this, but the UAE is one of the world's leaders in solar energy and is building the world's largest solar park. So if you become an engineer and study solar energy, you could be working right here in the UAE on the world's biggest solar park. Wind energy is also going to be extremely important. There's enough solar energy and enough wind energy to completely provide for all of the electrical needs of the entire world. In other places, geothermal energy is very important. You may not know it, but every time you do a query through Google, you're probably going through the data center that they've built in Iceland that is run entirely on geothermal energy. And hydroelectric, using the power of water. And again, the UAE is looking to be a big player in this by placing tidal powered generators in the Arabian Gulf and in the Arabian Sea. Other things that are going to be very important, green transport, as we move into a post fossil fuel economy and the COVID-19 pandemic is definitely giving us a strong push in that way because people are enjoying the fact that there's not so much air pollution, we're going to need green transport. And the UAE again leads the world in this with the Dubai Metro and the drone taxis that RTA is developing there's going to be more and more of a push to get to transport that is completely based on green energy instead of fossil fuels. Of course, nuclear power is going to be very important as we transition from current power sources to fully renewable. And the new clean, safe nuclear power, as has been set up in Abu Dhabi, is going to be hugely important to making that possible. So we'll need nuclear engineers. Of course, scientists have looked at climate change and because of the amount of carbon that's already been put into the atmosphere, there's a certain amount of climate change that we're going to have to deal with. There's no way to stop it at this point. And it's melting glaciers and the polar ice caps. It's causing the expansion of seawater due to heat and it's threatening the homes of about 1.5 billion people. By 2100, the place where almost 2 billion people live now will be uninhabitable unless we do things to block what's happening due to climate change. So there's going to be a huge need for engineers to come up with ways to protect areas like India, Nepal, Bangladesh, so forth, and also places like New York City and London, which are under the same threat. And our last ditch effort to save the world from a runaway greenhouse effect, if we have to, 
we may have to resort to geoengineering, such as what you're seeing here where a boat is going and spraying sulfur dioxide particles into the upper atmosphere to block some of the sunlight coming in and cool the earth off as a last ditch effort to protect the earth from runaway climate change. Engineers will also help with other things based more on computer engineering, such as machine learning. And no, machines do not learn like this by sitting down and reading books, but they do learn very well, as has been shown by IBM's Watson that ended up beating the world's best contestants on the Jeopardy show by Deep Blue that can beat the world's best human chess player and by Google's AlphaGo, which was able to beat the world's best Go player. We'll also need engineers to develop robotics for companion and service robots like Asimo, developed by Honda. We'll need robotics for repairing and enhancing human beings who've been injured. And of course, we'll need industrial robotics because companies will be looking to replace jobs with automation. Another area of engineering in computer science will also be hugely in demand for things like informatics. You've probably, if you've been watching the news, been seeing a lot of infographics put up, or you've heard people referring to certain websites that are giving consolidated COVID-19 pandemic information for the world. There is so much data available in the world that we need people who are data specialists who can analyze that data and put it in a way that makes it understandable for the general public, for governments, for business leaders, so that these people can be advised and make the right decisions. Of course, cybersecurity is going to be a huge issue. From the advent of computers, people have tried to break into computers and use them for crimes or disrupt computer networks. This is getting more and more common and cybersecurity experts are one of the most in-demand specialties in the IT industry and in my mind, one of the most exciting. I've had my certification in cybersecurity for more than 20 years. And to me, it is probably the most fascinating and exciting area to be in IT. Or maybe your interest is more in data mining. You'd like to work with Google or Facebook or the government and go through all of the huge amounts of data that are being collected in the world and finding the intelligence and the actual knowledge that's contained in that, the things that can be used to grow businesses or make good decisions. And of course, cyber forensics. As long as there have been computers, there have been people using computers to commit crime. And cyber forensics is also one of the fastest growing areas in the IT industry where people go through and look at computers and computer records and network devices and find out what crimes were committed, how did people commit those crimes and help bring those people to justice. Aside from the STEM careers and the medical careers, there are other careers that will always be in demand. For example, marketing. There is no business of any size that does not have marketing. Marketing is how you let the world know about your business. It's how you grow your business. And every enterprise, medium and large, and even many small enterprises have marketing departments and will continue to do so. And people will need to be able to do a lot of new kinds of marketing because a lot of the traditional means like billboards, and newspapers and even TV and radio are not working during the COVID-19 crisis and may never work again the way that they did. 
So digital marketing and other types of guerrilla marketing and social media marketing are going to be what's needed in the future. <clears throat> of course, finance and accounting will always be needed. Every business has money. Every business needs someone to keep track of how their money is coming in and going out, making sure that all of the government reports that need to be filed are filed, and advising them on the best way to invest their money or get more money if they need it. So those going into the fields of finance and accounting will always have jobs. International business is going to be hugely important. As this pandemic has shown, we live in a truly globalized business environment. And knowing how to start a business in another country, how to trade across borders, how to deal with all of the legal and regulatory issues, how to deal with the cultural issues, all of this is going to be necessary in order for businesses to succeed in the future. And of course, every business is composed of people. And people need managers to make sure that they're doing what they need to be doing to fulfill the vision for that business. And managers who can help them develop as individuals and become even more than they've ever been before. So business management is an area that is always going to be in demand. And of course, law. As long as there are people and as long as there are businesses, there are going to be lawyers. We need lawyers to write contracts. We need lawyers to help us in court if something has happened or someone has broken one of the contracts. Law will always be here as a profession and will always be in demand, albeit in the US, they probably do have more lawyers than they need right now. And as I said, the heroes of the future, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs will drive the new economy because they create jobs for the millions of people who are out of work due to the pandemic. Entrepreneurs are different. They don't take a job, they make a job first for themselves and then for many other people who work for them. And you may not have thought about being an entrepreneur, but it's really an important thing to the economy. It's an important thing to employment. And it's probably an area where some point in your life you will be involved with. Right now, 99.9% .9 of all businesses in the world are what are called small and medium enterprises. That means they have anywhere from one to 500 employees. Just under 60% of all of the employment in the world is in these small and medium enterprises. So it is very, very likely that you will at some point work in a small or medium enterprise. Just under 50% of all sales in the world are done by small and medium enterprises. So you already are doing business with small and medium enterprises, you just may not realize it. And of all the businesses in the world, just over 60% are sole proprietorships. They're owned by one person who may or may not have employees, but they're creating jobs, jobs for themselves and jobs for others. Being an entrepreneur is one of the greatest things you can do because it gives you control over your life. When you own the business, you're the one who decides what happens and how things happen. And you're not at the mercy of a boss. You're able to lead your business the way you believe is right and prove to everyone that you have the right ideas. So now that we've talked about picking a career, let's talk about getting into a university in the time of COVID or the post-COVID situation. The first thing that you need to do is find a university that you can actually go to. Given that the best epidemiologists are saying that this pandemic is going to last two or more years, 
it's important to consider whether you will be able to physically get to the university you've chosen and whether you will be studying online for your home for most or all of your degree. This makes a huge difference if your reason for wanting to attend that university is to get a passport or working rights in that country, as that most likely will not happen for online students. Or if the reason you're wanting to go is to access the physical facilities of that university or other things in that country. If your reason for going was based on getting a passport or work rights or spending time in that country, it may make a lot more sense for you to attend a university here in the UAE, especially if you can get the same internationally recognized degree. Any student completing their studies at Curtin University in Dubai, for example, will receive an Australian degree that has full international recognition. As I mentioned just today, Cambridge University, one of the top universities in all of the UK, has already announced that the entire 2020-2021 academic year is going to be conducted online. And many, many more universities, probably most universities across the US, Canada, Australia, and the UK are going to take a similar tact. You then need to think about, you then need to think about whether or not the university is in a place that is going to be uh, convenient for you. So if you are going to be studying online for your first one or two years, you need to think about the time difference. So if you decided to study at a UK university, but you're having to do it from Dubai, you have to understand there's a three or four hour time difference. If it's a US university, your time difference could be anywhere from seven to 12 hours. And Australia, four to eight hours. This means that your online classes may be at times that are very inconvenient for you, like two o'clock in the morning, and getting support from your professors or student services may also be very difficult due to the time difference. Of course, if you're studying in Dubai, you don't have any time difference. So your classes, even if they are online due to the pandemic, will still be at normal school times. And if you're studying at a place like Curtin, Dubai, where we deliberately keep our class sizes small to ensure that each student gets all of the support they need, you won't have any difficulty getting support from your professors or from our Student Success Center. Then you need to assess whether or not you'll be able to get into the university given that the board exams were not held. Now, Curtin has made a policy that will allow students to enroll based on their mock or their projected board results or based on their coursework in their last year of secondary school. Even if an English test is required, Curtin has made arrangements for this to be done entirely online. So whatever you have already accomplished in school can be used to go ahead and get access to the undergraduate programs at Curtin Dubai without having to worry about, oh, when can I sit the board exams? Do I have to wait a year? It's really important to consider the fact that this pandemic is likely to continue for two to three years. I have talked to some students who said, I'll just sit out a year, I'll wait, and then in 2021, in September, I'll be able to go to face-to-face -face classes. But when the best epidemiologists are saying the situation is still going to be the same next year and maybe into as late as 2022, what you end up doing is getting out of the habit of studying. So it's going to take you a while to catch up and get used to studying again. It's also going to delay your graduation. Let's say the epidemiologists are right, and it does take two to three years, and you decide to sit out until that point. Well, in that same two-year period that you were sitting out, had you gone to Curtin, Dubai, 
you actually could have completed your entire undergraduate degree because while Australia and the UK have three-year undergraduate degrees, at Curtin Dubai, we run three teaching periods a year. So you can get all six of your teaching periods completed in two calendar years. So you could sit out and wait for two years, or you could be done and ready to go into the job market in two years ahead of everybody who waited. You also need to think about the way the university operates. If you are studying online from a UK university or a US university, because of the time difference, instead of doing fully interactive online classes, they may simply send you video recordings of the class where you just have to watch and you don't have a way to ask questions, you don't have a way to interact with other students. At Curtin Dubai, we are conducting all of our classes fully interactive, where you're talking back and forth with the lecturer, you're talking with other students, you're breaking out into small groups to work together. It's exactly like what you would have if you were sitting in the classroom. It's just you get to sit there in your pajamas and you don't have to worry about catching COVID-19. So I think when you put all of these things together, the rankings, the quality of the faculty, the student teacher ratios, even things like cost and financial aid, where Curtin, even though we're the second highest university in the UAE and the highest ranked Australian university in the UAE, we've priced our programs to be very cost reasonable. We've provided scholarships for those who are excelling academically, and we've provided financial aid for those who have provable financial need. So we've made it affordable. We keep our student teacher ratios very small so that the faculty know you and support you. And of course, we have the highest quality faculty that we can have. Being a AACSB university, you'll be able to set yourself apart. As I mentioned, in the tight job market of the future, it's going to be very important to have something that makes you unique. Not only will it help you because you'll be able to list a top 1% university on your CV, but it will also help if you take any of the business programs at Curtin Dubai that you can put the AACSB logo on your CV for the rest of your life, letting every future employer know you went to one of the best business schools in the world. So I think when you put it all together and you're looking for a degree in business, computer science, engineering, or mass communications, it makes sense to join the highest ranked Australian university in the UAE, Curtin Dubai. We have the programs, we have reasonable cost and financial aid, we have low student teacher ratios, we have excellent faculty, and we have entry criteria that will allow you to enroll with the results you already have, and will make it possible for you to complete your entire undergraduate degree in just two calendar years. So with that, I look forward to welcoming all of you to the Curtin Dubai family in the future. And I'd like to thank you and open it up for any questions that anyone may have. Uh, if there are no questions, I would like to uh, let everyone know if you do come up with a question later on, please just email info, I-N-F-O, at curtindubai.ac.ae, and we will be quite happy to respond to any questions that you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan, so much for your time. This has been really, really informative and I'm sure everyone enjoyed it. I thoroughly did it myself, so thank you. Thank you. All the best. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.